Hey, I think we've actually got this. Uh, let me take a look here. Yeah, we're actually doing that. I want to thank everyone for tuning in today. i got to apologize right off the bat. I'm going to have to move if I'm going to get a better webcam feed here. This is... Uh, it uh, just doesn't work out too well. Um, uh, they told me that, uh, yeah, I, I'm stuck with upload speeds that are, uh, well, you would think it was 1995. Uh, but I'm glad to be here. Everyone tuning in here to the Agora on conference today. Got a lot of stuff to get to. I uh, thought it was a great discussion that we just had with Stephen as far as intellectual property. Uh, you know, that, that's a big one. Uh, one, I don't believe in rights anyway. That's a political issue anyway. But, uh, you know, I think a lot of it comes down to is, how many original thoughts do we really have? I mean, yeah, you could put together things in a certain way, but where are you getting the ideas from? Where are we getting the ideas from? I know I, I borrowed liberally from people like Lysander Spooner, and well, I made sure that most of the people were already dead, so there really wasn't too much of an issue. But, and I, you know, when we write something, we're always drawn on past experiences that we got from other people. And, and so uh, do you really own it? Uh, can you really own it? I mean, is it really that much different? I mean, really, how many original ideas do people have? I think what what, what I look at, because I'm, I'm an author, you know, I'll get that. I'll get that. I'll get that for everybody. Uh, I have a copy of it here, uh, Adventures in Legal Land, and uh, people have, people have uh, stolen it. If you want to call it stolen, uh, they have uh, made PDFs and they give them away or they sell it, and and that's just a, a, a risk that we that we. Uh, that we take when you're going to write something. If if the reason why you're writing something and trying to put something out there is just to get every single dollar from the market that you want, I think I would re-examine what I'm doing uh, and why I'm doing it. The reason why I did something like Adventures in Legal Land was and knowing that it's going to get stolen, and yeah, it, it currently does get stolen. Of course, uh, people, you know, they sell it. Um, I don't know if they've actually put their name on it, uh, but uh, they, they've sold it. Uh, yeah, they've done it, but it's the the information that is contained in here. I thought was uh, valuable, something that I believe in, and that uh, the information is out there. So if somebody is out there doing, in some cases, they're doing better marketing than I can. Uh, uh, the information is what's necessary. So we got more people questioning the concept of a state that it's a fiction. Hey. That, that's part of the objective. The objective was to get to a voluntary society. So if, uh, if I lose a few bucks, uh, that's the, you know, so be it. But, you know, the, you know uh, it's kind of a give and take when we have situations where technology is allowing me to do my own book. And then we, now we have e-books where you don't have to go through the, the humiliating process of submitting manuscripts and having people tell you what you can and what you can't write. Uh, you know, the ease in which we get it to the market and the money that we save and the time and effort, it, it kind of balances out. I wouldn't imagine that, you know, I mean, I'm still able to, to come to you today and pay for my internet service even though it's horrible. Yeah, so I had a call. I said, excuse me, uh, 1995 is calling. It uh, wants its internet speed back. I mean, it was ridiculous. But I think it was kind of, it's kind of give and take. I think we are going to a more open an open source uh, society, and I think it's a good thing. And the market's going to determine how these things are going to be protected. And just and I'll leave on this. What you what you want to keep in mind is that the information is what is important. And you need to be able to do something to kind of leverage. I'm able to leverage, and in, 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 in not all, every writer can do this. I mean, I, I write nonfiction. Uh, and these are based on my experiences so people can learn about me and how I do things. But it, it still doesn't replace me. So I'm still able to do workshops and things like that. Um, so that's something you want to keep in mind. If you're looking to release a book, an e-book, or something like that, you need to have some kind of leverage. This is, it's 2011. That's just the way it is. That's the light. That's the world that we live in. And I want to get a comment, Gene. I got the book for free, which boosted Stephen's reputation, whereupon I proceeded to pay him for his consulting services. Just an idea in the process. See, and that's exactly what I'm talking about. The, the leverage is there, that the book is just a small portion of uh, of what I have to, I mean, there's no way. I mean, the book it would well, like what I'm writing now. It's a constant 65 year process. You never get finished. Uh, that being said, uh, I what I'm talking about today, damage control. Uh, and 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 I know that there is one guy in particular, 
And so now we're going to have an, another video that we can post on the on the forum, uh, my website, markstevens.net. We finally got the forum back. I was hacked last month, which really sucked. But we got that back. Um, so you'll be able to see this. Damage control. Now, we're all working towards, I believe, the Agora. We're working towards a free market. I don't believe in, uh, uh, you know, obviously I don't think anyone in the audience is, is – looking at it where oh we've got to uh, we got to vote and we got to do this I believe in building the Agora uh, I mentioned in my book Adventures of Legal Land uh, almost 10 years ago where we need to provide better services at a better rate so I was talking about Agorism but I had never heard the word before and that's what we need to do we need to provide better services at a better rate than the people who call themselves government this criminal syndicate this cartel that, that they pro provide and uh, that's the way we're going to do it. Um, it's not a matter, you know, the civil disobedience comes into that because you're providing services without asking for permission, but you want to be smart about it. So if you look at, for example, uh, the contraband turkey situation where we had in Austin, Texas, uh, they told us point blank, I have the recording of this. You can get some of it on the website. My cross examination is on there, and I think it's in there where they make it very clear that this man who's selling poultry products to the uh, the Austin area, I think it was a 30 mile radius of his farm, it wasn't an issue of whether he did anything wrong. They agreed he's not accused of, any, of doing anything wrong. It was strictly an issue of obedience to some statutes. Okay, um, so when you provide, when you when you're engaging in uh, autonomous activity, you're going to uh, you you run the risk, of course. We always have a risk, but uh, when you're when you're acting as an autonomous adult and you're not asking for permission, you are going to increase your risk to a certain degree about attracting attention from the man. And he's going to be people who are control freaks. These are people who can't provide a service on a voluntary basis. And so, uh, if you want a real example, when I did my closing argument, I was able in the, the contraband turkey situation, was that. The, uh, the man, the people that were coming after the turkey farmer were the main reason why they were so offended was because he was able to do something that they couldn't do. He was able to provide the service, his services to a, a willing market where the man, the government, all governments uh, have to force themselves. So it's all compulsory that they have absolutely no voluntary support. And people who have no voluntary support... Uh, they tend to be extremely paranoid, uh, and, and so they can come after you. So if they do attack you, and I don't mean if they're coming in with the guns drawn, although that is a risk, uh, which you want to do whatever you can, of course, minimize. Uh, but when they do attack, most of the, a lot of times it's about a police officer or something, and you, you, uh, you get a letter in the mail. Uh, let's see. What a, what, yeah. Yeah, so I'll, I'll cover up the name here, but uh, you can get something like this. You get it from the the uh, the franchise tax board there, and uh, and it has all the the issues in there, and uh, that's the way you do it. Now, ju the, just the fact that I get this letter here, uh, yeah, this one's a little bit better. Just the fact I get a letter like this, okay? If I get a letter like this, uh, I think you can see that there. Okay, the fact that I have to open this thing up is a waste of my time. I'm not doing anything productive. I'm not doing something I want to do. So any time taken away from me and my family is uh, is wasted time. That's money that, that, that uh, I'm not being productive. It's time I'm not spending writing my follow-up book, which uh, just like Adventures in Legal Land, there's no copyright protection whatsoever. Although, I, I, at the time, I didn't appreciate when non-entity had to tell the whole damn world that. But that's fine. That's something I've come to accept. It's a part of, uh, it's a part of the world that we live in, where the new book, uh, yeah, it, it'll, be, it'll, be, uh, it'll be stolen too. So anyway, um, damage control. What does it mean? These professional predators want to damage you. Bottom line, that's what they're going to do. They were going to take your time. They want to take your money. They're going to take your property. They, 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 they're going to take it. And so we want to minimize that. We want to engage them as little as possible. We want to be as effective as possible. So I want to go through a number of different scenarios. Um, you know, things didn't work out too well this morning. We were uh, Ian Freeman, the Free Talk Live, uh, LRN.FM. Uh, we had a 
uh, hearing this morning that they did eventually they did not allow me to participate in. We were, uh, you know, the damage control uh, not working out so well. Although we think he's he's probably going to be out today. Anyway, um, so what do we do? What do we do? Most people have absolutely no idea, and this is not a slam against uh, against anybody. It's just we have lives. We have families, and we're more concerned with what's important with our, life, our family and our jobs and than learning how the structure of the IRS or uh, the, how the courts function and whatnot and, and, uh, and how to effectively deal with these people. But what a lot of it comes down to is just effective problem-solving, problem resolution. And uh, what I wrote in the book uh, still applies today. It's Zen and the auto litigation. And so uh, before I really get into that, I want to discuss a little bit more about the damage control and what that means because a lot of time, you know, I do, I spend, a, I spend a lot of time on the phone with tax agents. I showed you the Franchise Tax Board, uh, the IRS. Uh, that's, that's what I do. I, I do consultation, uh, which I, I discuss the issues with people and come up uh, with a, a formulated plan. And a lot of times that plan has to uh, do with getting on the phone and speaking to them. Uh, usually if, if you're listening and you have an issue with the IRS and you want me to help, I have to have you on the line. You authorize them to speak to me. But we have to do that every time, which is a real pain. Franchise Tax Board, uh, eventually they will accept the power of attorney and, and I don't need you on the line for that, which is good. But they like to play their games. Uh, and so what we're looking to do is when I say damage control, uh, we're, we're trying to uh, impress upon them that, well, one, it should be zeroed out if it's the Franchise Tax Board, if we're in court, if it means that the prosecutor will withdraw or he'll plea it down so that instead of $1,000, it's only uh, $100. And that might be something that, that you want, that you can live with. That's not something I can live with, but it's, it's a personal thing and, and it, there's no judgment there, uh, at least for me. So uh, that's what I mean by the damage control. If they want $5,000, we can get them to back off and it goes into the eternal black hole uh, that we get with the IRS with, let's say, the 45-day letters. So that's what I mean by that. So I've explained that ad nauseum. I'm absolutely sick to death of explaining that to this one guy, but now we've got video record. People can see that. If there's any questions, um, you know, and you're watching live, just, just send me a comment. If not, you can leave it on the form, uh, markstevens.net. So what are, we, what are we doing here? A uh, little example of, of some of the damage control and how I go about doing this. Uh, you want to separate the fact from the fiction. I mean, this is whether it's the IRS or it's your next door neighbor. You got to separate the fact from the fiction. You got to investigate, see what the heck is going on here, see what you're dealing with. You you want to clear out all of the of the opinions, especially when you're dealing with the franchise tax board. It's 99% opinions. I think about the only fact that they got here. Uh, it's the only fact that they really got right here. They got my mailing address. That's a fact. That that's that's where I pick up my mail. So uh, other than that, it's all opinion. So we want to be able to, to, to separate that so we understand what's going on. Uh, you always want to see what their strengths are and their weaknesses. So an example is when we're, when we're dealing with Ian in the, uh, the habeas corpus, I filed a petition as a party that I was the plaintiff on his, BS, on his behalf, uh, and, a lot, and I've done it before. And uh, someone, David, helped me in Keene. He actually did the groundwork and, and physically filing and everything. Anyway, um, one of the things that we were showing why the incarceration was illegal, aside from the fact that Ian was is a peaceful guy and had not been accused of, of hurting anybody, uh, he stood in front of a car for about 45 seconds or so. I think Mark uh, Edge from Free Talk Life uh, was saying that it was about, actually, the actual incident was 45 seconds because it was a second car. Anyway. Uh, aside from that, they have to prove, we'll, we'll look at, um, and this is something that applies with the taxes also, uh, at least when you're dealing with the Franchise Tax Board or, uh, or like the, the Arizona Department of Revenue. Uh, presence within the state is something that's very necessary. So what we did was uh, they have to show beyond a reasonable doubt in the criminal situation that you are present within the state on the day in question. So they would have to, I mean, it sounds, it sounds like it should be pretty easy. Well, Ian was standing right there. We have video of him. He posted it on freeking.com. We can see you right there. Uh, well, if you let it go at that, you, uh, you're letting them get away with, uh, or you're not demonstrating, and you're letting them get away with not proving an essential element of their alleged crime beyond a reasonable doubt. 
the uh, this is one of the many fictions that they bring to the table and, and to demonstrate that what we have is the uh, gosh I, I, I don't want to go crazy and waste time uh, getting this because I, I, I did put this on my website and if you go to markstevens.net I did put this on here um, when John Webb who's a, is a county attorney in Keene, New Hampshire when he filed his paperwork he uh, I'll put that up there I don't know if you're going to be able to read that uh, but it is on the website see if you can get that uh, maybe not. Anyway, uh, what it says here, and uh, you got to, again, this is all posted on my website, so you can you can see this a lot better. What he says here, now keep this, keep in mind, this is filed in court, and when you file something in court, you are certifying it is accurate. So you you can actually be sanctioned and uh, held in contempt if uh, if you're lying. But then again, that's all lawyers do. So what it says here. Now comes the state of New Hampshire, by and through the office of the Cheshire County Attorney, and hereby objects to the pending petition. In support, the state offers the following, and then and they go through their thing here. Wow, you know, it's a page of text. And then on the back page, where he signs it, he's signing it as the state of New Hampshire. It says, respectfully submitted, state of New Hampshire. Uh, and then, uh, of course, there's a, a scribbled signature there. So, and I have, uh, of course, this, this audio on the website, for those who haven't heard it yet. What happened was, uh, when you get into court, any court, usually what happens is they want to make sure, they want to know who's there and if everybody is ready to proceed. You know, what, who the appearances are and whatnot, and that, and that kind of stuff. So, Right at the beginning, and I'm doing all uh, the uh, I'm doing the speaking. I haven't been uh, stricken as a pl party yet. Remember, I'm a party to this. In fact, uh, uh, yeah, if you if you look at the paperwork, it says Mark Stevens et al. versus Richard Van Wickler. So I was uh, I was at one point a party. Um, what happened was I wanted a clarification. So when this John Webb said that he was representing Rick, Richard Van Wickler, the defendant, I wanted a point of clarification if he was also representing the state of New Hampshire. And I, because you know, I said in his paperwork, he claimed to represent the state of New Hampshire. So the judge asked him if he was, and he said that he was. Well, I wanted a clarification. I'm kind of weird that way. You know, it's kind of maybe a New York thing. You try to throw me a line of BS, I will tend to call you on it. It, it, it's caused me nothing but grief my entire life. So, what I had said, and I didn't get a chance to finish this, I said, I have a point of clarification. Uh, when Mr. Webb says that he's representing the state of New Hampshire, it, does he, what does he mean? Does he mean the, the body politic? And, of course, this is when Judge uh, Mangione, uh, I, I called it his controlled rage, uh, stated that, uh, sir, don't start with me. And I said, well, excuse me. And he said, sir, don't start with me. He was very, and every time I tried to, to talk, uh, he would, you know, shush me. So I got the point. I understood, and because Ian's butt was the one actually in jail, I didn't want to push it. So it's a very touchy, uh, it's a very touchy issue with them because you're dealing with a fiction. And why else would this judge, and, and I don't have all the time, I don't want this to just be about Ian's thing, we're going to talk about it more on my show tomorrow, uh, the No State Project, uh, we'll have more details what's going on with that. Uh, it's a very, very serious issue. Uh, when you listen to the audio, or if you've ever been in the court, you know that when you raise the issue of the state, and rem remember we're in court, uh, you're supposed to leave the opinions at the door. When you have somebody claiming to represent the state or claiming to rec represent X or what it, whatever it is, they should have to prove that. That's not my rule. That's their rules. Now, how do I? How can I be so confident that I have to show that I actually represent and, and go through all the process and doing a representation and answering all these freaking questions? Because I was deleted as a party by the same judge. Judge Mangione didn't want me to represent Ian. Start talking about qualifications. I'm not a member of the bar. All this other stuff. 
The interesting thing here is, why is he so concerned about me and to a point of not allowing me to speak, but John Webb can say he represents the state of New Hampshire, he doesn't have to even clarify that. Any questioning whatsoever is immediately, sir, don't start with me. Can you imagine you stop and you get a traffic and the cop pulls you over, he just walks up to you and he says, excuse me, let me see your license and registration. Sir, do not start with me. I, I, I wish that weren't. <laughs> Yeah, uh, save me a lot of time, money, and energy. And you know, if people want, you know, well, then again, I don't have to do consultations anymore. Just all you got to do to get these people to back off, is, sir, don't start with me. That's 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 the new legal standard. Just tell them that Judge Mangione sent you. So it's a very very serious issue. It's a fiction, and all you're doing is calling attention to it, and you want them to verify it, but they can't do that. This is part of the damage control. You don't want to come off as fighting them. I know it may seem that way to them, which is which is bad, and and we need you know, and, and some of us have much better courtroom demeanors. Uh, well, most people have better courtroom demeanors than me, uh, unless of course you know you're in the Northeast. Then it's not you know it it doesn't sound nearly as bad. Um, uh, but if you don't separate the fictions, uh, your chance of damage control pretty slim because. This is an actual element of the alleged crime. If we look at Ian, for example, or any traffic ticket, uh, whether it's a crime or a, a, a civil thing, they're treating it, it's a crime, like a parking ticket, but they treat it as civil, it all has to do and hinges on what the hell do they mean by the state of New Hampshire? What are they talking about? And why, when I bring it up, are they so adamant about not talking about it? And I'm not talking about just Keene, New Hampshire. This happens all over the place. This is not exclusive to the, uh, uh, these people in, in New Hampshire by any stretch of the imagination. When you bring up the fiction, the state, that, 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 that's bad news for these people. They can't make what they do look good anymore. Because what they have to do is in Ian's situation, they had to prove beyond a reasonable doubt he was within the state of New Hampshire. Well, the state of New Hampshire is filing paperwork. <laughs> so the state of New Hampshire is not the ground. And that's easy to prove. Again, there's some pretty, pretty good evidence that this judge knows where I'm going with this, knows damn well it's a fiction, knows that they never proved beyond a reasonable doubt that Ian was within a fiction, and that's why he jumped all over me. And that is just, that's one of the, uh, one of the uh, really effective ways of going about the damage control. Uh, it, it basically impresses upon this bureaucrat, this tyrant who's looking to steal your property, uh, that you're not worth the time. It's just not worth it. I, I mean, I mentioned uh, on Free Talk Live last night, and I'll mention on, on my show tomorrow, the issue of the state of New Hampshire is not going away after Ian's petition for rid of habeas corpus. Well, well my petition, actually. It's not going to go away. I can guarantee you it's not going away from, my, from, from me. I, I'll be calling and sending them document, documents uh, requesting. I, I like to know. And I think that is something that you need to do and everybody should do. Question them. When you say state of New York or you say state of California, what are you talking about? Just explain it. What are you talking about? Because it's a fiction. New, see, New Hampshire's easy. I can remember the date on that like New York. There was no state of New Hampshire prior to July 4th, 1776, but the land was there, the ground was there. Where, you know, the land that they claimed Ian was on was there. Well, the street may not have been paved, but the land was there, and that's what they're trying to confuse. So what bureaucrats do, the reason why they can be so damaging, why people just give in, is because people just accept all these fictions as real and they don't challenge them and they don't re and, and even if they do understand a little bit that they can challenge these things they uh, just out of fear they they well that will just cause the prosecutor to get pissed off it'll make the judge get just enraged and, and yeah that's always a possibility because look we're dealing with criminals however the overwhelming majority of the time it does result in less of an attack it, it results in less of um of, a, of the damage that they want to do to you, because like you know, a lot of times the cop doesn't show up because he don't want to deal with this. Because every single instance that I'm aware of, when you question the police officer on the fiction of the state, he'll be declared incompetent. 
So that's a pretty strong thing, and that's something the damage control we're going to be demonstrating in the in the traffic study, which I'll talk about more uh, as we as we go on. Again, if you have any comments, I guess you have to get onto Facebook uh, to send any comments. Uh, easiest for me anyway. I don't have to go into uh, into Skype. So that is just one of the fictions. It's one of the many, many, many fictions. So what are some of the other fictions that they hit you with? Now, if you're talking about something like with the with the California uh, franchise tax board. Uh, the fiction is that it's coming from the franchise tax board, <laughs> uh, or that it's the state of California. Again, we have that fiction. Um, the other things that they're going into is they're calling you a taxpayer. And I have enough information on the website that you 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 can spend uh, quite a bit of time on. I have actual hearings that I've, I've done, tax hearings, there was one that was in January where we were talking about the issue of taxable income, taxpayer and whatnot, and the agent actually, uh, Scion her name was, uh, under oath, not that that means anything to me, it doesn't, uh, but it means something to them. Under oath to them is very important. She testified under oath and or admitted that she wasn't qualified to make an assessment against my client that he was a taxpayer and a taxable income. That's in a tax hearing, and she also said she wasn't qualified. Uh, she wasn't uh, authorized to do it, which I thought was pretty impressive. But when you take a non-confrontational stance, and all you're doing is you're asking questions, because what I like to do is I go in and I say, look, um, I just want to plead no contest, or I just want to pay this fine. I got a few questions, and and then we can take care of this. It's not combative. I'm here to settle. And I really am. Um, I don't think I owe anything, and I can prove that, but, you know, we'll talk about it. So I get it. I start to break down these fictions. So effective damage control uh, is not just trying to go in and blast them on their fictions. You've got to get a little bit of a, a, little bit of a, of a, a basis for that. Now, if you listen to, to my show, uh, you'll notice that I don't quote statutes. Uh, I, it's just not something you need to do and it's not something that if you get a letter from the IRS or you have to go to court you don't really have to quote statutes especially when you're dealing with taxes one you don't want to quote the statutes because nobody gives a damn what my interpretation of the law is not, nobody, you know, and, and they care even less they don't care so what I want to do is I want to get some idea of the process that we're going through to get this thing tossed out what do I need to do? So one of the first things I need to do is I need to know when I get on the phone with the agent, do you have the authority to throw this out? It's a little different in court, of course, because in court, we already know the judge has the authority to throw it out. That's an old brainer. Uh, but when we're talking to the IRS or some other bureaucrat, we don't know. You don't want to make an assumption. Uh, you know the whole thing about assumptions which I had an IRS, a, an FTB employee, I, I have it posted on the website on the Nicole the Shame, his assumption. Um, so when we're dealing with the tax guys, we've got to find out what the process is. We want to know, do you have the authority to throw out a ticket? Now, our object is to get the, the thing thrown out. So what we want to ask, once they say they have the authority to do that, the thing we have to move on to next is we have to know what the grounds are. Now, they're not going to want to offer to you what the grounds are. They're going to want to just move on. So this is something that's very, very important. Now, uh, I did this with a Daniel with the Franchise Tax Board. I have the video on the website. Um, got him to admit that, and I'll help, I'll help him out. You usually have to give him a little bit of help so you push him in the right direction. Like I said, they're not going to want to offer that because uh, they don't like throwing these things out. And they, very, and they don't always do that considering all the hundreds of, a thousands or millions, really, tens of millions that they're dealing with, very few of them actually get tossed out. Not, not one of their strong points. I don't like to do that. So you want to find out why. Who cares what the statutes say? It doesn't matter. You've got the guy on the phone. He's got the authority. Let him think that. You just want to know what are the grounds. So you offer. What a lack of evidence and witnesses, would that be grounds to throw out an assessment? And they'll generally agree to that. Because then you can just help them out and say, well, if you had an arbitrary assessment, it wasn't based on qualified witnesses and evidence, you would go ahead anyway. They're not going, they, they, they don't agree with that. I mean, they're, 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 they're corrupt, but they still want to put on a good face. So we can use that to our advantage. Now, this is very, very important. You're walking them through a, set, a process here uh, because if they have authority to throw it out and there's grounds to throw it out, 
when now you can start hitting their generalizations hard. It's going to make them uncomfortable, so it's very important you're doing this professionally. It helps because I'm on the phone and I'm not actually sitting there in front of them, so I, you know, to reach out and, and grab them by the throat, like sometimes you feel compelled to do when you're talking with these people. <laughs> so, um, what you want to what you want to uh, have them do is uh, you you want you want to walk them you want them to walk you through the process, and and so before you before you get a, you know a really big question a que you know as far as their generalizations you want them to walk through the process and be familiar with the process because they may have never have done it before and I want to thank Alistair Kinnear for reminding you of this kind of sales technique that you want to use to get them in the frame of mind of kicking it out that the the whole frame of reference is getting this dropped, getting it dropped, okay? So what you want to do here is now once you've talked about all this, about getting it dropped and there is grounds and he has authority to do that, you want to now throw him into a double bind by asking him if the opinions that you are a taxpayer and have taxable income, or whatever the opinion happened to be, uh, whether you're subject to the zoning laws or whatnot, uh, are those opinions irrefutable? Now, Knowing the IRS the way I do and speaking to these agents on a pretty much daily basis, I know that they're, they believe that they're never wrong. They, even when you get the Franchise Tax Board, for example, I've, and I've got them recorded admitting mistakes, they don't put it in writing and they resist you. They don't want to admit that. Uh, they have a mantra. Anyone who's ever dealt with the IRS knows the frivolous mantra. It, it's reflexive. There's no thought involved. Uh, they, you, 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 you start questioning and saying that the IRS said the assessment is wrong. They, it, they automatically shut you down or shut you off, and it, you, they're done. As far as they're concerned, you're, they're done, sir. It's, it, we're not wrong. It's not wrong. If it's not, and and so they hold this opinion. It's absolutely irrefutable. Now the problem that they have is they've just walked me through the process of throwing a an assessment out. So that's, that, that's not good. Why would he have the authority to throw an assessment out if their opinions are irrefutable? So it kind of puts him in a bind. What's more important to him is authority or that it's irrefutable? We've also got on our side uh, the fact that they believe that their little administrative process, the uh, collection due process hearing, which isn't a hearing at all. At least uh, uh, I've had a number of them admit that it's a hearing in name only, not in the legal sense, in any sense, in any it's not in any legal sense a hearing. Uh, it's, it's a phone call. It's like what we're doing now. They would call this a hearing. Oh, and you got all the due process. Yeah, of course, a due process. Yeah, it was a phone. It was a phone call. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, because they believe that they're, and this is of course part of the double bind. You damned if you do, and damned if you don't. What's more important to you? Uh, because they believe that they provide you a a due process hearing, and they believe that their courts. Are fair and administer justice. That's going to that's going to conflict pretty damn hard with their other generalization that the opinions are irrefutable. So what they tend to do is drop the irrefutable that it can be shown to be wrong. And and I got to tell you, anyone who's ever dealt with the IRS, if you just get them to admit the possibility that their assessment is wrong, huge. Huge. I, 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 I can't, I, I can't under, underestimate the importance of getting them to at least let your foot in the door that this assessment is wrong. Not going to want to do it. But we only get to the point that they admit it could possibly be wrong by putting them in a double bind. And uh, there's got to be a, a, a graceful way to do that because if you don't, you're not going to be able, you know, well, you're not going to be able to close this many times. Anyway. So remember that you want to treat them with kindness, professionalism, and, and, and be courteous and zen in the auto litigation. You want to treat them the way you want to be treated. Treat them with respect even if inside you're, you're boiling. Uh, anyway, that's where we are. And it works the same way in court. It's, it, it really is the same kind of model when you're in court. Don't be afraid to ask the judge point blank, hey, what are some of the legal grounds that would be acceptable to you to have this thrown out? Just ask him. It's not legal advice. You're not asking him what you should do. You just want to know. Look, it's a basic understanding of how the process works. How can you accurately or competently defend yourself if you don't know 
what an acceptable defense is in that court. Just ask them. Uh, it's like a lawyer the other day trying to tell me they don't consider, a lawyer for the Franchise Tax Board, she, again, she does not consider, uh, she said, uh, it is not threat, duress, and coercion when the government threatens and coerces you to do something. And, and so I wanted her to explain that. I said, how is it not? She said, well, the law says it's not. Really? Can you cite that? What? You're telling me that the legislature actually got together and passed a law that says if, if the government forces you to do something, then it's, uh, it's not, <laughs> I'm not holding my breath waiting for her to, uh, to respond to that. I, I don't think she's going to do that, but uh, I, I, I won't drop it. But uh, she won't be responsive when I ask, uh, what's the, is there any factual difference between that? Because you know, she's, you know, she's not going to answer. She knows full well it's factually the same thing. When, when they tell you you have to file the 1099 uh, or you go to jail and a $5,000 fine, that's threat, duress, and coercion. Uh, you know, literate people understand what that means. So, uh, I got a question from Gene. Uh, briefly discuss the two types of damage control. The difference between damage control on the part of the victim of state aggression, trying to limit the amount of damage the state does to you, and damage control on the part of the state who might dismiss your case or get off your back in order to prevent further damage to the illusion of legitimacy. That's a damn good question, Gene. I, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, it really hinges on the same thing. I think it, it's one hand wash and the other. They To limit the damage that they're doing to you, they need to limit the damage that's being done to them because all you're doing is exposing them for what they are. Uh, people, Someone mentioned this to me this morning. He said, wow, I really like your method. Said, My method is it, it, just questioning. It, it, and, I, and, and do I own it? No. It's, uh, I think they call it the Socratic method. But... Um, I may, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping I'm being uh, clear enough, so let me know, uh, send me another thing if I'm not being clear enough. I, they, they, these are one hand washes the other. The worse I make that judge look, I, I think the more inclined he is, because he has to protect his facade of legitimacy, he will be more inclined to throw it out. So um, I, I think they work hand in hand. I don't think we can separate the two. Uh, by me engaging in damage control, I'm giving him a reason to engage in damage control himself. Because an example of that is, say I'm talking, say I'm talking, right, both parties are engaged in damage control to some extent. Because what I like to do, and some uh, people have said to me in consults, now with, with a consult with someone who's never been to court before, I totally understand this, where they'll say, if you say these things and give the cop a copy of the motion, aren't you giving away your uh, the, the element of surprise? And I, I don't need it. I mean, if I'm dealing with somebody who's got absolutely no evidence whatsoever against me and they're dealing 95% with fictions, I don't need it. So what I like to do in, in a situation like that, Gene, and, and, and this is a way of pushing him into his own form of damage control, of course, is to telegraph what I'm going to do. So if I am bringing up the issue of the state, and they are just coming after me, and they're threatening me with contempt and, and whatnot, an example of that was with uh, Yeoman, the, the turkey farmer guy. He said he had a judge yesterday in a traffic ticket, and uh, the judge was kind and nice and, and professional. He's asking questions, and he was asking about the state, and he said that he didn't represent the state, he didn't represent anybody, that he was fair and impartial, and he was neutral. And he says, but, you know, so are you here on your own authority? He said, no, I'm fair and impartial. Okay, my head would have exploded at that point. So what Yeoman did was say, well, then who signed your paycheck? Well, that's when all hell broke loose and the judge started screaming about contempt and, and stuff like that. So what I like to do is telegraph, in, in that same situation, what I, what I do is tell them, uh, this issue is not going away. Uh, if you don't want to discuss the issue with the state, I, I'm going to bring it up on cross-examination with the cop because, of course, he did write the ticket. Now, what that does is I don't have an element of surprise. I don't need it. It's not what I'm looking for. My strategy is I want, to imp I want it in his head. Damn it. He's not going to shut up. <clears throat> I now have him itching to deny me cross-examination. And, and this is something that I'm doing in my, my No State Project traffic study. I want to be able to also demonstrate to people that when you've got somebody 
who is so arrogant and so rigid in his behavior, it's very easy for us to then manipulate it, okay? And, and I want to be able later, if they will come on the show or do an interview, and let them know, by the way, if you look at this part of my website, you'll understand that we predicted and we were trying to manipulate you. And the reason why we could manipulate you so easily is because of your behavior. So you may have the guns, all right? You have the guns. But I, I got to tell you, when I come into your court, I'm the one who's in control. I'm the one who's manipulating it. I may not get the thing thrown out, but I'm the one who's manipulating your behavior. And I did that. The reason why I'm telegraphing is because that's how I'm manipulating your behavior. I'm planting a seed in the judge's head. He, so he's and a the prosecutor. They're itching to stop the cross-examination. They, they are look. They no more want to get into the issue of the state of New Hampshire as a judge then they want to sit there and have me question the cop on that because the cop doesn't know nearly as much as the judge so uh, so he's itching and I know he's itching to do it because it every single time uh, let me look I'm running out of time here uh, so very briefly when you're doing this when you're asking about the state and I've mentioned this before but it, but, but it's important so you understand how why it's so effective to, to to do this in advance, they have to prove presence within the state. They know they have to prove presence within the state to prove that there's, a jur there's jurisdiction, that there was a cause of action. And I told them that I'm going to ask the cop these questions. So I asked him point blank. So the first question I asked, they're already itching to make an objection and impeach their only witness. That's the thing they don't get. I th I think, how could they not catch on to this? How could they? But then again, there's nothing you can do. What are they? They're just going to deny cross. And this is something that happened just recently, I think it was last night, where not only did they stop the cross-examination, they stopped the defense. There's no defense. There's no defense. So uh, consider this, because I have, you know, people who think I'm just an idiot. And I, you know, I, you know I, depending on who you're talking to, it's a subjective thing. I, I, I won't debate that issue. Um, consider what you've done, though. You've not only got the judge to deny cross-examination, which I can show people how to do in, with two questions, which is easy to show. Cross-examination was two questions. That's not a cross. But you also get the judge to stop it dead in its tracks and declare you guilty without you putting on a case. That's huge. Huge. So unless you're in Afghanistan or Iran, I don't even know if you can get away with a denial <laughs> over there also. A judge denying uh, a defense, uh, pretty bad. But anyway, so I've actually manipulated them to that point, and they know you manipulated them to that point when they declare the witness incompetent because you know he's you're asking the questions about the state and factually what the state is, and they say the witness is incompetent, and then you want all you want his legal opinion stricken from the record, which. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Prosecutor, Mr. Judge, Mr. State of uh, New Hampshire. The cop wrote the ticket, and he's accusing you of violating the law. That's a legal opinion. He's not competent to do it. You asked for it to be stricken. At that point, now they've got your number. They say, oh, oh, this guy just played me. He just, he, he, he just, and there's no defense against it. It, 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 it. The only thing they can do is just say, you know what, I'm not going to give you a trial at all, jerk. Uh, it, it, fine, if you don't want to give me a trial, it's less time i got to spend in this place. So I, I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to be too concerned with that. So these are some examples. Uh, the model kind of follows that. All you're doing is you're pointing out what the fiction is. You know, you, you know what the fiction is going in or if they throw a fiction at you, and then you just start asking questions. You just, oh, I have, oh, oh, well, I have taxable income, really. Now, we all know there's no such thing as taxable income. It's a fiction. It doesn't exist outside the head. Just like the state. There is no state. But they're going to throw that out at you. So start to separate the fact from the fiction. Is there a factual difference between income and taxable income? Because they will tell you that they're different things. They will actually tell you that there are factual differences. They don't want to talk about what they are. But once now I've, dis I've gotten them to admit that there's a difference between income and taxable income and it's a factual difference if they don't want to discuss it from that point I got a factual dispute and I don't have enough time really to get into why that is so much more effective than trying to bring a legal issue suffice to say you can't have a summary proceeding if there's a factual dispute and that's a pretty big one I mean that goes right to the heart of the matter so one of the things that I've got set up 
to help people learn the damage control and, and uh, minimize the risk is I've set up the No State Project traffic study. And you go to my website, markstevens.net, and if you're interested in participating, uh, my email is on there. It's uh, markstevens at markstevens.net. And you're free to call into the show tomorrow, and we're going to be discussing this. And so I wanted to be parking tickets because we're minimizing the risk. I don't want any confrontations with the police. You leave your car knowingly in a no parking zone where you know, of course, enough that you just get a ticket. You don't get booted or towed. And don't go into a handicap spot. Um, but uh, I, I just got to remind myself about the handicap. And then you get yourself a ticket. Uh, somebody, that, if you've been following the show, went in yesterday. It was a $1,000 parking ticket uh, because uh, it was a handicap zone. And uh, he went in last night, some pretty good damage control, got it thrown out. He has not given me any details yet, so I don't know if it's because the cop didn't show up or what. Uh, but a $1,000 parking ticket, kicked out, didn't cost him a dime. Well, he didn't give them any money. Uh, so what we're doing is we're minimizing the risk. The, there are a lot of, every issue that I bring up on my show, pretty much uh, in the book, that you can use to challenge the government and show that it's completely illegitimate. Pretty much all those issues you can bring up in a parking ticket. It's all the same procedure. The only difference is what you're being charged with. And so your risk, one, you don't have a, a uh, what could be a deadly confrontation on the street. There's no taser. There's no gun. You just take the ticket. Bada boom, you go and you, and you take care of it. And uh, you file the paperwork. But you're going to file the same paperwork that you would file if it was a moving violation or uh, you didn't have a driver's license or something like that. Uh, a lot of the same issues even in a drug possession. The fact that there has to be a case of controversy, you have to violate someone's legal right. Uh, okay, and then, of course, you also have the fiction of the state. All these issues you want to challenge now come to you without the risk. And if it comes down to it, you lose, okay, it's less than 100 bucks. You've learned, you, 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 you've done a very effective job of, of challenging them. And you've learned, and most people tell me, even if the ticket isn't thrown out, they've been empowered to stand up to the man. They're not going to do it stupidly because they can't understand now what's going on. But they have the, uh, the tools now necessary to stand up and live a more uh, free, autonomous life. I know I have a contradiction in saying a more autonomous life, but you, you get my point. Uh, but they're more they're, they're, they have more uh, integrity or not integrity, but they have um, they're they're bolder now. They're more willing to stand up instead of just paying the ticket because it's only fifty bucks. They'll file some paperwork and make an initial defense because you can always just pay it later. So that's what we're doing. And what we're able to do is predict the behavior, which I think is very very important. How can a schmuck from Long Island? be able to predict how a judge is going to respond and do things in Brisbane, Australia. I'm familiar with the rigid behavior. I'm familiar with how they do business. It's very simple. Okay, And so I want to show that we get the same responses crossing imaginary state lines. And I'll be able to quantify everything. And so what I'm going to do is it'll be an e-book. It'll, it'll, it'll come out next year after, of course, uh, government indicted which is the follow-up to Adventures. The long, long-awaited follow-up. But we'll be able to quantify the results because I have documentation that I don't release for obvious reasons. Uh, one, I don't have the time to redact everybody's name. Uh, but I do have documentation of, uh, that I do post on the website when not the tickets are thrown out. And we've had you know, a lot. You know, so 75% of the time, somebody files the motion. And we always send a copy to the police officer. 75% of the time, the cop does not show up, which is great because the ticket most of the time is thrown out. Uh, unlike yesterday, where the cop didn't initially show up and the judge called, you know, called an adjournment and forced the poor guy to uh, wait a few hours for the afternoon, the afternoon session. Uh, I be, uh, okay, so uh, uh, we'll be able to show, let's say we have 20 participants, which I have about 20 now, uh, we don't need any more in California, by the way. Um, but but if uh, if you're in England in the right spot, you want to be able to get to a magistrate. You want to be in an area where you still get the magistrate if you're going to do it in England. So I do encourage that. Uh, but uh, we'll be able to show out of 20 people, let's say 14 or 15, the cops 
14 or 15 the top, uh, out of the 20 times the cop didn't show up. So that, that's going to say a lot. And they're always typically under subpoena or shouldn't be. So and we've had people report that they saw the cop at, at the uh, courthouse. They just wouldn't come in. So I got a, uh, I got about 10 minutes left. So I want to get to as many questions as we can, so uh, you can start sending them up. Uh, but uh, Gene, put, uh, let me. See. Oh gosh, you guys are really, okay. Uh, let's take. Um, okay, the state is more is more the concept with the government being the social embodiment of the state. Actually, I'll, I'll just take a moment, Derek. To the, the state is is a fiction, and if you uh, go in and you challenge a prosecutor or a judge or somebody to prove that there is a state, if you ask if there's evidence of a complaining party, for example, they won't be able to show it because the, uh, a state is a body politic. So if you go into and you actually look at the Supreme Court decisions and you look at their, like the Massachusetts uh, preamble, you'll see it's a body politic and that's made up of citizens and citizens are members of the body politic owing a duty of allegiance and return for duty of protection these are reciprocal obligations and I have that all in the book and because they uh, they have no duty to protect you whether by law or the fact that they put a gun to the side of your head you either pay or get shot uh, there's no obligation to protect you obviously if somebody was interested in protecting you they wouldn't be threatening to uh, to, to kill you and put you in a cage so um, it, because of that, though, that relationship between uh, with gov with allegiance and protection, because that is that doesn't exist, there actually is no government. It's not just a matter of there is no state to have a government as opposed to a gang, because government is just a label uh, to for the label to match for the map to match the territory. There has to be a state. Without a state, you just have men and women. And that's really the way we need to look at it anyway. Uh, one of the effective ways of, of doing the damage control and limiting the amount of damage is not to accept the fiction that they are the government. It's just uh, Chuck or Feynman or whoever it is I happen to be talking to uh, at the time, uh, Rick, Van, uh, Rick Van Wickler. It, 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 he's not the sheriff or the, the, the head of the Department of Corrections. It's Rick. So that, that, that does help. Uh, we have, so, so when you ask what is the state of New Hampshire, aren't in legal terms we just referring to the government and thus a person representing the state of New Hampshire representing the government? Uh, Scott asked that. Actually, no, uh, uh, because like I just mentioned, uh, the state is, is supposed to be in combination. It's the body politic in a certain area with a government. That is what makes the state. So if you look at what's going on in Palestine, it's interesting. I'm coming out with my new book real soon, and in the adventures I wrote about this also, about the Palestinian state. You've got the people there. You've got the land there, but you don't have a state. <laughs> so uh, so you, you've got to have that, you've got to have that, um, that relationship there. You got to have that, uh, that. That so without that relationship between the people uh, being with allegiance and protection, you don't have a state, you don't have a body politic, you don't have a government. You just have literally a gang of killers, thieves, and liars. Uh, says, what do you, uh, Mama Liberty is saying here? What do you say to people who insist that one should refuse to speak to the police in any way, shape, or form? I'd rather not. But in many places that can get you pretty dead. What would be a good rule of thumb? If you are on the side of the street, you can wind up dead. You say as little as possible, but it's yes, sir, and no, sir. Most of what you're doing can be corrected in court. They can't prove your presence within the state, and the cop is not going to pull his gun on you while he's on the stand. Now, if you're in a smaller area, and this happened to me out here in, 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 in Phoenix, where I was stalked by, I don't even like to give his name out, because the guy is, he, I mean, he's, he's one of these cops that scare cops. Um, you got to be very, very careful in areas like that. The guy stalked me, and I actually had him basically admitted on the stand. I mean, this this, this judge went absolutely ballistic. Oh, he, he made it clear that he still didn't like me, uh, but he didn't like the cop uh, stalking me. Uh, so you want to be very careful. I think if you're taken into custody and you're not on the side of the street, unless you're, you know, uh, Chicago's obviously going to be more dangerous than, you know, somewhere in uh, in New Hampshire or uh uh, yeah. <laughs> or Vermont, uh, but you generally want to keep your mouth shut. You can't help your situation by talking. So if you're in the street, in the car, yes sir, no sir. Uh, if you feel that you you, you know you've got to say, just say, look, I, I I think I may need an attorney. So at least if you say something, they try to use against you. You've invoked your right to counsel. Well, you you don't want necessarily, and you don't want a public defender. But anyway, uh, that's what I would do. Um, I, do I need? I think I may need an attorney here. I don't need if I no, and it may result in your incarceration. But at least you're not dead on the side of the street. I, 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 
that's my big thing is I don't want you dead. Uh, we make judgment calls all the time. Uh, today's not a good day to die. I'm not looking to be a martyr. I think there's a lot better ways to come to, to get to a voluntary society. Uh, I mean, I, I've been to Jaro Pyle's gulag a number of times, and uh, they're still writing tickets. I mean, even getting tickets thrown out is not is not something that tomorrow they're going to say, well, you know, it's just not working out. Let's not give out these tickets anymore. Um, Okay, I have Gene saying, how about I'm cooperating officer, but I don't consent to searches, or am I under arrest or am I free to go? I would read the body language, Gene, in a situation like that. See how aggressive the police officer really is. I definitely recommend, uh, if you listen to my show with Alistair Kinnear, he gave a pretty good uh, rundown on how to deal with the police officers to, if they are coming at you aggressively, to try to calm them down. Uh, I, I'd like the, I am cooperating do not hide your hands. Um, don't do, do anything that could be construed as being aggressive because you'll wind up dead. I, I am firmly of the position that you're dealing with a five-year-old with a gun. And, I'm, and I, I, on an intellectual level, I mean that literally. He, you, are, you are dealing with somebody with the emotional capacity of a five-year-old child. And um, uh, because five-year-olds, of course, their only means of uh, communicating when they're not getting what they believe that they're entitled to is to start yelling, screaming, and, and, and doing that. And that's exactly how cops behave. Cops believe they have to be in charge of you or in control of you, and if not, then it's a dangerous situation. And I think, Gene, what you're saying here, I frequently said I'd happily speak to your supervisor. What is his... If you, if you can get the supervisor to the scene, if you believe you've got an unstable uh, police officer, definitely ask politely for the supervisor to get there uh, uh, because uh, the, it lessens the chance of you getting shot. I, I, this is something, it's a very volatile situation. Um, before I run out of time, I, I, I think it's very important on this subject that uh, you keep your mouth shut as much as you can. You're very polite, respectable. Do not put your hands where he can't see them. Make no sudden movements. And most of the time, I would say, you can correct mistakes in court. Um, and, and again, you cover yourself by saying, I think I may need an attorney. Okay. Uh, have you seen you and a police? Yes, I have. Um, you got to be very careful when you're carrying a gun. Let the cop know that you do carry. And Okay, so if he approaches the vehicle, let him know. Officer, I, do, I, I like to advise you, I am armed. So that... And, and then if you have to get a supervisor, that's great. Uh, do that. Uh, Scott's saying, what do you say about having a tape recorder in your car that you turn on when you're pulled over? Uh, I generally, if, if, you know, if, if, when I would record them, I didn't even tell them. So uh, I know you may have said, you know, I don't know if we have to really worry about that so much now because of uh, the, the ruling in the Court of Appeals. I think it's uh, in the, the Massachusetts case that uh, they're, they're, they're backing off of the whole wiretapping thing. And, and so I, I generally wouldn't even tell them. In fact, I my little act of civil disobedience, I didn't tell those guys up in Keene last uh, Monday that I uh, I violated their little rule about recording. I recorded the entire hearing. So and and yes, I will put the entire hearing on my website for those who can take the uh, excruciating minutia of a judge. Uh, uh, oh yeah yeah. Anyway, I will get that. I'll, I'll, I'll get that. But yes, Gene, they are backing off as, as far from what I've noticed, the prosecution of wiretapping uh, charges against the police because the Court of Appeals did rule uh, a few weeks ago that it is not. Uh, it's a First Amendment issue and they can't arrest you for uh, uh, any, well, they can't legally arrest you now according to this decision uh, for recording the police officers. So I don't remember the name of the case, but you could do a Google search, Scott, and you could probably find that uh, pretty quick. So I don't know how, effect, how effective it's going to be, if the police are going to care, or if the lower courts are going to give, you know, because as a guy, you know, I think he's looking at something like uh, 75 years in jail for recording the police. But I don't think he's actually in that district. So look, look the case up, and, and you can see that, yeah, they, uh, they said it's a First Amendment right, whatever that means, and it's not a crime to... Uh, in a public area to film the police while they're on the job. Anyway, unfortunately, I am out of time. I had a blast doing this. I want to thank George and everyone at Agora.io for putting this on because I'm a tech, uh, I'm not a tech guy, and I'm lucky just to be able to get this thing going. Uh, more information, go to markstevens.net and the No Stay Project. We're live 4 to 7 uh, every Saturday, and if you want to join in on the No Stay Project uh, uh, traffic study, 
just give me contact me and we'll, we're going to be getting started real soon. Again, thank you very much. Bye.